Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast, the resource for transitional and experienced genealogists who want to create a successful business. I'm your host, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Here you'll learn from professionals all around the world who work in the field of genealogy. Are you ready to get started? Then let's get going. Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Today, we head across the ocean to England to get to know genealogist Audrey Collins. Audrey, welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Hi, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Audrey, let's get started by having you tell us about yourself and how you got started in genealogy. Well, long story, but I'll try and keep it short. I work at the National Archives, where my job title is Family History Specialist. But I first became interested in genealogy when I was probably about 12 or 13. I used to copy all these family tree charts out of history books. And they were all about kings and queens and things. And then it occurred to me, that's just a way of describing a family. I must have one of these too. So on the grounds that I knew all my aunts and uncles and all my grandparents, I figured that my parents must know all their aunts and uncles and grandparents. So I asked them and I wrote the information down in four separate trees, one for each grandparent, and I've still got those. And I didn't do anything at all with that for about 20 years. And then I was looking through the uh, evening classes that were on and I thought, well, shall I, shall I learn picture framing or shall I do family history? And because it, it just fitted in better with what my, my husband wanted to do, uh, I said, OK, well, um, if you want to do something on the picture framing night, I'll do family history. And that's how I literally how I started learning family history. And it was only really two or three years after that I began doing family history research um, as a job as a what we sometimes just call a gopher in the old pre-internet days when you wanted to get a census return or a will or a certificate you had to do it by post which took forever or you got somebody who was near London to go in person and get the things and I was one of the people with an easy reach of London so I just used to go and um, get stuff for people who were doing their own family trees and uh, gradually I branched into doing actual casework for a company that offered a family tree tracing service. And I was just one of their London agents. And it, it, it sort of blossomed from there. Lots of odd things happened on the way. And I have a, a, a very happy knack of just being in the right place at the right time. So I'd like to think that I've got my perfect job through my own sheer raw talent and patience and persistence and hard work. But to be honest, a lot of it's down to sheer dumb luck. Were you working before you started to do, as you describe it, this genealogy gopher work? I, when I left university, and I'd done history, but I just had, had enough of it for a while, and I went into a totally different line of business, I was going to have a brilliant career in retail management, and I was a, a management trainee at a major department store group. I really enjoyed that. Wait, then, which which store was it? It was John Lewis, okay. which is uh, it was one of the, the better-known stores here. I don't know if it's got any penetration whatsoever across the Atlantic. I don't think so. But I don't think so. It was, so. Um, you know, it, it's very sort of fairly high class department store group. And I absolutely loved that. And then about two and a half years in, I, I, I carelessly committed motherhood. At the time, it wasn't so easy to carry on working when you'd got children. And I discovered this great earth mother inside me and I I really liked being at home with my son and I liked it so much I had another one so although I never stopped working I just worked on Saturdays and little bits and pieces that I could fit in odd little casual jobs and then when my sons were quite a bit older and I'd become interested in family history I realized that earning money through family history as I said just going and getting certificates and census returns and wills for people I could do that and I could fit that in round uh, school hours. And if I ended up through my own poor organisation typing up reports at 3 a.m., well, that was my problem and nobody else's. So I started doing little bits of that and I carried on working on Saturdays in the department stores. And then gradually I got to the point where I was doing more and more family history and I was enjoying the shop work less and less. uh, and And I gave that up. But there was quite a long overlap to what I was doing, uh, a bit of both, which was very interesting. Tell us about that other job that you had. You said you, work, you started to work for a company and going and pulling records for them. 
Tell us about what kind of company that was, how many people were doing the same type of thing as you, that kind of thing. Right. Well, this was after I'd been doing my my gophering job for a while. And I used to advertise in the family history press along with lots of other people. And I was contacted by the owner of this company, which was quite a small one. It was called Windsor Ancestry because they were based near Windsor. It was really a father and son operation. And they operated through uh, lots of agents, mainly in the London area and other parts of the country. And they were the people who did the interface with clients. They would advertise in in the, in the general press and they offered a something like a fixed price package that they would do what was called a round of research for a fixed fee. And they would say, tell us what information you've already got. Tell us if there was something you particularly want to find out. And then we'll get our researchers to do that much research. And it worked very nicely for me because they would pay me up front half of the fee, which covered my costs when I was buying certificates and getting document copies. And I know that's a a big problem for a lot of self-employed people, that you're working for clients who are very, very grateful. But I know you'd really like it if they were so grateful they paid their bills. I never had that problem because I always got half up front. Because I was working for them, I was doing actual casework. I would just be given a case. Here's the information. Do what you can within the resources at your disposal. And if a line started going off in a regional direction or it turned out that somebody's parent was Irish or Scottish, then I would say this is as much as I can do on this. So I'll I'll fill in a little bit with uh, some incidental detail. So they get their money's worth. But if they want any more, then you'll need to get the researcher in Scotland or Ireland or some other part of the country to do the local stuff. And that became the backbone of my work. I I did work for other people as well. And I did have some direct clients. But the, the majority of my work was working for Windsor Ancestry as one of their agents. I don't know how many there were altogether. Not a huge number. Um, And we used to see each other occasionally, probably no more than about half a dozen or so. And that was something that worked quite well in the late 80s, early 90s. Now, most of what we do, what we did then, one person could do from an office because there's so much that's online and you do so much remotely. But it was a fantastic way of learning at the time about a variety of different kinds of records and kinds of people that no amateur family historian, however good, is going to come across because nobody's family is that varied. It was brilliant. Did you have a sense of where the clients were coming from? Uh, were they American? Were they English? Or was, is that, was the information about the client sort of hidden from you, you know, because you were just given your cases? I knew a certain amount about the clients, really on the basis of the family history information they were asking me to find out about. So although I didn't have their uh, addresses, I had their names and I knew a fair bit about their origins. And the great majority were British because I suppose that's where they were advertising was in the British press, things like the Radio Times and uh, and other publications. So I knew that they were mainly people based in Britain, very occasionally be an overseas one, but mainly they were domestic And what I found very interesting was sometimes they would give the reason that they were doing this. Sometimes it would be just, oh, that looks quite interesting. I've got money to spare. But very often it would be someone who was perhaps had just become a grandparent and they would become very conscious of their place in a sort of great continuity of family. And they thought this would be a nice thing to pass on to a new generation. And sometimes it was almost the opposite way around where you would get members of a family who were looking for a, an interesting and uh, original present for something like a you know, 50th anniversary or an 80th birthday or something like that. So it was very often something to do with a milestone in their lives that made them conscious of them fitting into a, a greater pattern. At least that's what I thought anyway. How does the timeline proceed from there? How many years are you working in this capacity? And then what made you set your eyes on the National Archives? And, you know, I'm dying to know, how did you get a job at the National Archives? (laughs) Yeah, this is where the sheer dumb luck comes in. I, I was doing this from, I suppose... Altogether, it was about 15 years. And to begin with, it was overlapped with my still working in retail. And my children were getting older and older and a bit more independent. So I didn't have to race home 
uh, for them coming in from school. But I was, st- I was still married at the time to a reasonably high-earning husband. So I could fit things around domestic responsibilities. I didn't need to be a breadwinner, which was a great luxury, and I will cheerfully admit that. But as I got more and more into it and gave up the retail job that I'd been doing, I, I became more and more experienced. I also branched out into doing other things. I realized there were lots and lots of people who could do the basic just fetching of certificates and basic casework, and lots and lots of people knew about that. But I realized there were things that maybe I could do that not so many people were good at. So I started doing talks to, first of all, my own family history society, and then uh, a few slightly wider afield than that. And I realized I could also write a bit. So I wrote occasional magazine articles, not not in a huge way, but I gradually built up a, a bit uh, of, of doing that. And I also started teaching basic classes as well. Even when I was self-employed, I, I had a finger in several different pies. So I had lots of sources of income, none of them very lucrative. And then when I was getting divorced and I needed a steady income, and this is where I, I was incredibly lucky. At the time, there was a place called the Family Records Centre, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was set up jointly by the General Register Office and the Public Record Office, which had census and wills and a few other things. That was also in central London, but in a different building, a few streets away. Both buildings, for various reasons, were being vacated, and the two organisations came together to have a central London search facility. I was one of the first people in Through the Door as one of the frequent researchers. Uh, I was also the first person to write a book about it. Now, it was only 13 pages long, but it has an ISBN, and it's in the British Library catalogue, so it's a book. So I knew the Family Records Centre extremely well, and I knew the people who worked there. And it was a fantastic place to work, and there were hardly ever any vacancies. But just at the time when I really desperately needed a steady income as an employee, instead of just relying on what bits of um, freelance work I could do, there were a couple of vacancies came up. And I, uh, I, I applied, and uh, and I I got one. At the time, I just wanted a part-time job because I was still doing a lot of freelance work, and I wasn't sure how this was going to work out. As it happened, after a couple of years, I wasn't really too great at juggling the two things. So when I had the opportunity to work full time, um, I took that. So uh, and that was that was a couple of years in. I started in 2002 at the Family Record Centre, and I was working there full time from 2004. So when does it become a job at the National Archives? Is there some internal changes that make change it from the Family Records Office to the National Archives? Is it the same organization? And was there a move? Because I always hear people talk about the National Archives at Kew. And was, was it somewhere else and then it went to Kew? No, the originally the old public record office was in a wonderful old Victorian wedding cake of a building in Chancery Lane. It was the public record office that joined together with the general register office to set up the family record centre. So we've got a whole load of acronyms here. When I joined, although I worked at the family record centre, I was employed by the public record office. And then after a year, public record office became the National Archives. So I was working for the National Archives at the Family Records Centre. But the headquarters of the National Archives was at Kew, and, that, uh, and that's the building where I work now. And that building went up in the 1970s. So it's a very confusing history. And if you have an old book that refers to Public Record Office or Public Record Office Chancery Lane, you have to know a little bit about the history of the organisation to make any sense of it, because what is this Public Record Office in Chancery Lane? Oh, That actually means the National Archives at Kew now. So I'm sorry about the complicated history. So the Family Records Centre was in existence until 2008. And uh, a decision was made actually a couple of years before that, that with the rise of more and more online resources, uh, there was no need to keep on this um, expensive London walk-in centre. So the two organisations withdrew and all of those who worked for the National Archives were relocated to the main office at Kew, which is um, where I now work. And that happened just about March 2008. The Family Records Centre was no more. So we were all concentrated in, in one place at Kew, which was very interesting. 
And um, there have been a few changes since then. And that's where I am now. I've changed my job within the organisation at Kew. I think it was about 2009. I honestly can't remember. I got the job that I'd kind of always dreamed of, which is family history specialist. And I can't think of a better one. And, uh, you know, I'm going nowhere until they throw me out or make me retire. I absolutely love it. Tell us about what exactly you do as a family history specialist for the National Archives in the United Kingdom. I am part of a big department, which is called Advice and Records Knowledge. As far as the researcher or the public is concerned, we are the face of the National Archives. We're the people that you see if you come in and you're doing research. We're on the inquiry desks and we help you out when the printers don't behave themselves, all that sort of thing. We answer the email inquiries. We do live chat. We're the people who answer the phone inquiries. So so we're the people that are not necessarily famous names. It's we're not that important. But we, we are the, the, the public face of the National Archives. Behind the scenes, there are certain things that we all do. One of the things that everybody has to do, along with a lot of volunteers, is cataloguing and indexing. We're supposed to spend about half a day a week doing some kind of cataloguing so that the, the, uh, the, the millions of record descriptions that we have are improved. Uh, so that's an absolute a requirement. Everybody does that. And we also obviously do all do our various shares of public duties on the desks, answering phones, emails and things. Behind the scenes, then we've all got more specific jobs. I'm in the public history team and we range over local history, family history, diverse histories. We've got a transport history specialist, really all the things that don't fit neatly into uh, another, you know, a specific record area. The other teams are things like modern domestic, modern overseas, and we've got medieval specialists, early modern, maps and photographs, and, and of course, a, a very large team which deals with military and naval and, and air force because that's a huge uh, subject of interest to family historians and also there are lots and lots of military historians. Those of us who are specialists... We can give specialist advice and contribute to online guidance. We've got lots and lots of research guides uh, on our website. If you go into our research guides section, within the family history category, there are 207 guides. Though I didn't write all of them. I didn't even write very many of them. But those are the things that the record specialists do behind the scenes is either write the guides or contribute to them or help to update them. And we also do things like public talks. We attend conferences. We speak at conferences. We do webinars, which is a comparatively new thing for us. We've been doing it for a couple of years and we're still trying out different ways of uh, uh, working with that. So we're, we, we do a lot of sort of education and outreach. The other thing that my own team, the public history team, is involved with is events. So if there are public events on at the National Archives, whether it's just people coming in and sitting down in a room to be talked at on a particular subject, or whether it's um, an online event like a webinar, or sometimes day conferences, we've had a couple of archives at night events, anything that is a public event, where members of the public are coming into the archives or tuning into the archives, there are people on the, the, the team that I work on who are more organised than I am who make sure that that stuff just works, that tickets are sold usually through Eventbrite and that people are there to, the equipment's all set up and that people are there to be greeted and pointed to the right place and told when it's time to go home and make sure that the speaker turns up and gets paid, all that sort of thing. I imagine that getting a job at the National Archives now must be fairly competitive. Is there a lot of steep competition for people trying to get a position there? Well, I'm, fortunately for me, I don't need to know whether there is or not because I've got my job and I'm sticking to it. But um, usually when we do have a vacancy, there is usually a lot of competition for it. A number of the jobs, particularly the record specialist jobs, because they are very specialised that you need to be you know, have, have uh, expertise in a very specific area such as medieval records or maps and photographs or something like that. We do get a, a lot of um, competition, uh, so we usually get very, very good candidates. And some of the younger people, and by younger people, I'd say you know, those that are under about 45, 
But the people who have come into my department within the last couple of years, some of them are really, really good. Give us a sense of how many people are coming to the National Archives at Kew on any given day. What types of people are you finding? Are you getting family historians from America or Canada? Or are these British historians, British professionals? Are you getting authors? What type of people are using these resources? All of the above. Uh, We do get a fantastic variety. We have people from all over the world. Family historians obviously tend to be domestic, or they've come from places like North America, Australia, South Africa, where there's a big British or or Irish diaspora. But we we get other people from all over the world. We get lots of um, graduate students coming and looking at our, particularly our foreign office collection. So people are not genealogists at all. And the other group that we get, apart from family historians and the sort of academic researchers is huge numbers of military researchers, lots of medal specialists and medal collectors. And yes, we do get authors and sometimes quite famous ones, which, you know, we have to be terribly cool about that and not be all fangirly and, oh, look, there's so-and-so. We have to be very professional. So we do get all sorts of people, but family historians, military historians and academic researchers, usually postgrad students, are probably the three biggest groups. Kind of give me a picture of some of the innovations that are new and are are happening now as a way for the National Archives to reach out and use technology to, you know, to reach a, a, a greater audience. Oh, the, the biggest single development that by a long way, has been the internet and the ability to reach people, not just through webinars, but by putting records online. And that's completely revolutionised the access to records. When I first started working at the Family Records Centre, we had a fairly large search room and we maybe had, oh, I'm not good with big numbers, but say 100, couple of hundred microfilm readers acres and acres of microfilm cabinets and I think we had six computers and you had to feed discs into those and they were for using family search on and we were still getting used to that because that stuff used to be on microfiche and this was newfangled. Now we have computers as far as the eye can see and we have in our main reading room I think we've got six microfilm readers and a couple of microfiche readers and we're cannibalizing those for parts and an awful lot of people are accessing the basic records that we hold, the really popular things, military records, census records, and some wills and probate. A lot of that stuff, it's online. So people have often looked at that before they come in and even think about looking at any other kind of records. Or they've looked at some of it, and then we can direct them on to something else. But that something else might well be an online resource which they can access for free when they're in our building. They might have to pay if they're somewhere else to one of the commercial sites because we've licensed a lot of our records and you'll find those on the big commercial sites like Ancestry and Find My Past. Is there anything you offer electronically at your location that isn't available on one of the commercial sites? There are a few things. We have some records which we have digitized in-house. They're on within Discovery, which is our online catalogue, and that it's called digital downloads. And those are records where we have digitised them and you access them through the catalogue and then you find it's a digitised record so you can download it. There's a charge for that and it's pay-per-view. We don't have a subscription. So those records, you can access them free when you're on our site. If you're not on our site, then you'd have to pay to download them. Some of them are free, either where we've had a lot of external funding for some project or sometimes if it's what we call digital microfilm, which is records that they're not going to get the five-star fully indexed or singing or dancing treatment anytime soon, but we've got microfilm. So we've scanned loads of microfilm and turned it into enormous PDF files, and those are usually accessible free. So instead of going to a building getting a piece of microfilm out of a drawer and putting it on a a reader. You can do that at home. You still have to go through it frame by frame as though you were using microfilm, but you don't have to come to the building to do it. We have very few things that you can only access in the building. 
And that's where we've got institutional subscriptions to things like the Times newspaper, Digital Archive, and uh, some state papers online, and some of the, the kind of resources that you might expect to find in a university library, things like British parliamentary papers online. Those we have licenses that allow us to make them available in the search rooms, but not externally. There aren't very many of those. The real unique product, the thing that you absolutely have to come to us for, is the original documents, which haven't been digitised. And although we've digitised what seems to be an awful lot, either by ourselves or by licensing them to a commercial company who uh, they, they stump up the costs for doing all the digitization. That is still only a tiny, tiny fraction of all the records that we have. We stopped counting at um, 100 miles of shelving, and that was several years ago. So goodness knows how much we have now. I know that you have travelled to the United States for conferences, when you did that, were you traveling in an official capacity for the National Archives, or were you doing that on your own? And also, what benefit did you derive from coming to conferences in the United States? Well, it's an awful lot of fun. I just love it. I really like visiting America. And I now have lots of friends there, some of whom I've even met in person. Most of the time, I'm traveling just because I want to. Occasionally, I am officially on behalf of the National Archives. More often than not, I pay for my own trip. But if I'm speaking officially on behalf of the archives, I may be able to claim a day or a couple of days. But I can say that, look, I am at Roots Tech and I'm representing the National Archives. And I sometimes I'm, I'm having meetings with people at Family Search or, you know, other, other people. They see me as the face of the National Archives. I always make it very clear that I'm not that high up the food chain. But on the other hand, I am the person on site at an FGS or an NGS conference or at Roots Tech who happens to work for the National Archives. So I quite often get invited to meetings and focus groups. And you know, it's a good opportunity to just liaise with people. And sometimes back home, they said, well, if you're going to Roots Tech, are you going to this or that conference? While you're there, could you just? I'm usually doing it because I want to, and I may get some comeback from the National Archives. But there's there's only been one, which was um, very nearly 10 years ago, uh, the wonderful FGS conference in uh, Boston in 2006. And I was part of a, a whole, uh, you know, the British are coming group. There were several of us, two of us from the National Archives and uh, some other British people from uh, from other organisations. And that's the one and only time I have had all my everything paid for and uh, subsidised by the National Archives. But most of the rest of the time I do it because I really want to, um, and I wouldn't if I didn't. What have you gotten out of networking internationally with people who aren't local to the United Kingdom? Apart from meeting lots of people that I really like, and I always look forward to going back and renewing acquaintances, I think one of the things I found most useful is that by attending American conferences, I get to understand how Americans do research and the assumptions that you have. Back home in the UK, although I'm based in England and I sound English and I've lived in England for nearly all my life, I come from Scotland. And Scottish genealogy has some very, very distinct differences. You use one set of assumptions about the way records are constructed and when they start and what you can do with them. And then when I switch between England and Scotland, I have to think, oh, no, this is different. This is different. When I'm trying to explain to an American about doing a bit of British research, it really makes it so much easier for me if I understand the sort of things that they're used to. Something came up very recently. I was taking part in a, a Google Hangout with uh, one of Dear Myrtle's Hangouts, and it, we were doing a series about British and Irish military records. And this seems like quite a small point, but I realised in conversation there that military records that you have in the United States, an awful lot of them are categorised according to a particular conflict. So you've got Civil War records and you've got War of 1812. Uh, and I have contributed some... Um, quilt squares to the uh, preserve the pensions quilt that's being constructed at the moment and you, you've got Korean War records and First and Second World War and so on whereas our records on the whole they are not conflict specific 
We have a few sets of records that have got maybe First or Second World War in the title, but they tend to be things like campaign medals. For the most part, we've just got soldiers' records or officers' records, and they will relate to maybe a particular period, but not conflict-specific. We don't really have a set of records that you can bundle together and call Crimean War records. That really only struck me about three or four weeks ago, and I'm learning things all the time, even though I've been spending a lot of time hanging out with Americans. I still pick things up. But, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. That's the way you approach these records. It does make it easier the next time I'm trying to explain something to an American researcher, whether they're by email or at the National Archives in person. I think it's interesting that it actually helps your job, you know, interfacing with Americans. It helps you serve the Americans that are visiting a little easier because of that awareness. That's pretty cool. Audrey, what's the most fun project that you've worked on at the National Archives that you can share with us? I think probably it's the most recent one that I've been involved in. Having found myself a nice, comfortable niche, mainly hanging around in the 19th century, uh, a lot with to do with census records. I found myself being dragged forwards into the 20th century. And, and I was doing a lot of work with some home front records for the First World War. But what I really got caught up in and has taken up at least half of my time for the last several months was a major document release that we had in November last year, which was the 1939 register. And this was a register a bit like a census. Uh, It's not quite a census. And this was taken in September 1939 when Britain was already at war because war had broken out at the beginning of September. But at the end of September, this national register was taken and that was used to give everyone an identity card and a ration book And it was also used later for conscripting people into the armed forces and for directing labour around the country. Now, this is an amazing set of records, and it's very heavily redacted because we have data protection laws that mean information can only be released from this register if the person named is deceased. So although it's roughly contemporary with your 1940 census, it's a lot more heavily redacted. Learning about this was absolutely fascinating. Release, having it released as an online record was incredibly complex and all sorts of data protection and technical challenges involved in doing that. Now, they didn't particularly concern me because that was a licensing department dealing with Find My Past who had the license to do this. But I was called on a tremendous amount for records knowledge on this And really, nobody knew a tremendous amount about it, a certain amount about the background, but the way that it actually worked, all the nuts and bolts of it, and what all these abbreviations in it mean, and the way it worked on the ground was just absolutely fascinating. And I knew not very much about it a year ago. Now, I'm absolutely up to my ears in it. And whenever I get the chance, I'm down in the staff reading room, going through more and more documents because somebody's asked us a question. And we've thought, no, I have no idea what the answer to that is. But you know what? I will go and find out. And this is fantastic for me, not just because it's a really interesting project and it's something that is still within living memory. So I know a lot about it, about that period from what my parents told me. And obviously, I still know there are still plenty of people around who remember it for themselves. But it gives me a chance to go and look at records and actually do some research, which is the one thing that we don't really get to do very much. I walk into this wonderful building every day and I go in under that sign that says the National Archives. And that's the shot that you will see on TV programs. And I walk in there every day and I think they they pay me to turn up here every day. How cool is that? But the thing that we don't get to do very much of is work with the records because we're dealing with the public, we're keeping the guidance up to date, we're doing all all sorts of things to enable other people to do research, but it's quite rare that we will get to sit at a desk 
for a couple of hours and look through something that we're not actually cataloging. So being able to go and poke around in these records and find stuff is just the most tremendous fun. And I'm still up to my ears in it and I'm still absolutely loving it. So we have a thing here on the Genealogy Professional Podcast called The Lightning Round, where Mm -hmm. I ask you a bunch of questions, a little bit faster tempo, and it's your chance to provide a little bit of advice and, and other wise words to our listening audience. Are you ready? Okay, then. All right. Uh, What was the one thing you were most afraid of when you first got your job at the National Archives? Looking like an idiot. I was scared of thinking I knew what I was talking about and then inadvertently talking nonsense and giving somebody bad advice. And, of course, that was for naught, and it it didn't really happen, right? It all worked out. Of course it did, yes. (laughs) I've never never given the wrong advice ever. (laughs) What is the best advice you've ever received from someone else? Oh, this was wonderful. Because we have to deal with loads and loads of questions about all kinds of subjects, and we can't know everything. And one of my senior colleagues, who is just one of the most knowledgeable people ever, said, remember, sometimes giving advice means that you can read through the research guide faster than the inquirer can. And I found that terrifically comforting, that somebody as knowledgeable and experienced as that still knew that we don't know everything and it's okay not to know everything. I found that very comforting and I pass it on to newish people who are learning how to do the inquiry duties too. What is one specific action listeners can take in the next 24 hours to help them transition into a genealogy career? That's really very difficult because I had no particular career path. I I think probably the, the best thing for them to do is to find out what other genealogists do, work out what the opportunities are. Like I did when I was just doing my gophering job, I looked to see what is there that I think I can do well that not everybody else can. And in my case, I went to looked at teaching and writing and doing talks and things. Other people might have some sort of technical skill that they can combine with their genealogy. But I think it's look for something that not not that many people are doing that you know you can do well. Do you have a productivity tool or it doesn't have to be necessarily productivity, but something that just helps you in your work or maybe an app on your phone that you can share with our audience? It's not a very original one, but I absolutely love Evernote. It's just brilliant um, that I can have it on any all, all my own personal devices. And I've, I also have a work iPad that I can get it on. You know, it, it's it's a tough call because Dropbox runs it fairly close. But I think just, just having Evernote, wherever I am, whichever particular piece of kit I happen to have with me, I can just update my notes uh, and make notes in real time. And I think I can't manage, I don't know how I manage to live without it. I really mm-hmm. don't. Are you on social media very much? And if so, what is your preferred social media channel? Intermittently, sometimes I I do a lot. And it's really between Facebook and Twitter. Facebook is, well, you you can be a bit more discursive on Facebook. You can join in a conversation. But I do like Twitter because it's really fast. And you see something, you think, that's good. And you retweet it. And you don't really have to interact with somebody. So it kind of depends what mood I'm in. I've always thought you, you pick the right medium for the message. If you can recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be? Well, it, it is a genealogy book. And in some ways, I hesitate because it's quite an old book. And it's now so massively out of date that most of the records referred to it, and a lot of the, the, the information has been completely superseded. But I still think it's worth it because it was called The Family Tree Detective by Colin Rogers. And it was published in the 1980s. And although almost every address in it is probably now out of date because somewhere's moved, and it was entirely pre-internet, but it it wasn't a how-to book on family history. It was a problem-solving book. And it made you think about different ways around a problem. It wasn't all about this is what this record is about. This is how you use it. It really gave you an idea of how to think around a problem. And if you could boil it down, really, it would be try to remember you're not after a particular record. You're after a particular piece of information or set of information. 
if you if you want, for example, details of somebody's parents or to prove or disprove a relationship, it might be on a particular kind of document. But if you can't, for some reason, get that, here are some other ways of thinking around the problem. And I think that's been most valuable thing. So it's massively out of date now, but the essence of what it has to say, I think, was absolutely tremendous. Give our audience one parting piece of advice and then tell us how we can get in contact with you. Parting piece of advice is always go back and look at what you did before. There's the number of times I have done that and something just jumps out at you. Even if you did really good, careful research, you will have missed something, possibly because there was a name in there that wasn't familiar, didn't mean anything to you at all at the time. But five years later, when you've done lots of other research, a name of somebody that someone perhaps who was living next door to your family and you see them on a census return or a witness on a certificate that suddenly now jumps out at you because you know who that person is and they mean something. Uh, And I have done that countless times going back over my old research and spotting something that I'd never seen before. And if people want to get in touch with me, my personal email is probably the best one because a the work email is incredibly long and I'm not always there to pick it up. My personal email is aud.collins, that's A-U-D dot Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S, at gmail.com. Audrey Collins, thank you so much for coming on the Genealogy Professional Podcast today. Thank you. I loved getting a behind-the-scenes peek at the National Archives in the United Kingdom from Audrey Collins. As well, I really appreciated learning how she was able to win such a coveted job, even though she claims it was just a case of being in the right place at the right time. But let's not forget her career growth and hard work building an independent genealogy business and working as a consultant. Audrey gave us a sense of what archivists do at the National Archives, as well as what is available to archives patrons. And she talked about the importance of networking and how that has directly impacted her job. In news items, I'm just back from the APG, that's the Association of Professional Genealogists, Professional Management Conference in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It was one of the best conferences I've ever attended, and I so appreciated that it was focused on the professional and business aspects of genealogy. I'd like to do a follow-up podcast episode dedicated to the PMC 2016, and I'd like your help. I'd like to hear from attendees, speakers, committee members, and board members so that they can share the positive benefits that the conference had on them. This involves recording a short audio clip that can be used in the podcast. Preferably, this would be recorded using Skype, but in a worst-case scenario, we can use your telephone. I'd like to do the recordings on Tuesday, September 27th, or Friday, September 30th, 2016. If you'd like to participate send me an email at contact at thegenealogyprofessional.com. Everyone is welcome, so don't be shy. During the month of October, I'll be presenting two webinars. The first on Thursday, October 20th, is called Boosting Facebook Posts and Creating Saved Audiences. I know what you're thinking. I'm never going to need to boost a post. Learning to boost a post on Facebook is actually an important skill that you should have before you need to use it. You might not need to use it for your own business. Hopefully, you'll reconsider that. But it would be a great skill that would benefit a society or organization that you volunteer for. And what about those saved searches? That's the most important and critical part. Saved searches allow you to target exactly who you want to reach. Setting them up is easy once you learn how. The second webinar follows this same theme. Once you've created a boosted post, you'll want to track how well it does, and not just with Facebook Insights. The second webinar is called Tracking Success, Who Really Visits My Blog and Website? In this webinar, we'll take a close look at a free tool called UTM Tracking and how it is used in conjunction with Google Analytics to give you precise details about who is visiting your website, blog, or YouTube channel, and from where. This is better information than you can get from the insights or analytics built into your website or blog platform. You may be surprised to discover how your audience or followers are really finding you. The webinars cost $19.99 each. For more details or to sign up, go to thegenealogyprofessional.com. 
In other news, there is a new SLIG scholarship for first-time institute attendees. The Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy is pleased to announce that applications for a new SLIG scholarship are being accepted. So who can apply for this? The winning candidate is probably not yet employed in the industry or working in a related non-research position. They are most likely not advanced in their research skills and might even be self-taught. Regardless of level of experience, they have a few things in common. They have not yet attended any of the National Genealogical Institutes. They are ready for a more in-depth learning experience at an intermediate or above level, and they would like to attend SLIG. If you fit this description, you are eligible to apply. Successful applicants will receive full tuition toward the course of their choice for SLIG 2017. Visit ugagenealogy.org for more information. Just look for the scholarship, the SLIG scholarship link. The Board for Certification of Genealogists will be offering a free day of quality education on October 7th in Salt Lake City. Top genealogists Pamela boyer Sayre, Elizabeth Schoen Mills, Ann Staley, Jean Bloom, David McDonald, and Judy Russell will present six one hour lectures held at the Family History Library between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. The lectures are free and open to the public. Most will also be broadcast online. You can register for the online webinars by visiting familytreewebinars.com forward slash BCG. Before I end, I want to give a shout out to Little Dochi and Love to Research for leaving reviews for the show in iTunes. I really appreciate the time you took to leave the review and to let me know that you like the show. Thank you. And let's not forget an action item before we end. I loved what Audrey had to say about networking. She said she was able to learn how Americans do research and the assumptions that they have about research because of networking with them. And that helps her better serve them when they come to the archives in the United Kingdom. Networking is important, and it can change how you perceive other genealogists, your clients, and the people who serve you, such as librarians and archivists. I want you to get out and do some networking. I'm going to give you two options for this action item. Your first is to find a local genealogy society, club, or group near you. Find out when and where the next event is and attend in person. The second option is to choose someone you already know but not too well and invite them for coffee or tea as the case may be. This can be done either in person or virtually using a tool like Skype. Connecting with other genealogists will help you see a different side of the community, and it'll be fun. That's it for this time. Until we meet again, keep improving your business skills and take at least one step to push your business forward. The Genealogy Professional Podcast is a production of Fieldstone Common Media, copyright 2016. Executive Producer, Marianne Pierre-Louis. Creative Producer, George Edwards. Production Assistant, Pam Wolos. Technical Director, Jean-Luc Pierre-Louis, Jr.